Good day to everyone. Uh, we quickly realized after um, I completed my message on Sunday that the sound uh, kicked out um, actually twice uh, during my message for a considerable amount of time. And um, I felt a stirring uh, in my heart that uh, I needed to re-record it. I know this is kind of tedious and won't be exactly the same, but I felt that the information and the, the message that the Spirit had led me to speak about that day uh, should not just uh, be for the people that were able to attend uh, at in within the walls of our church um, on Sunday morning, but for everyone that can hear. Um, and so people can share this message, uh, especially during this time. And so, as I said, this was message was a little bit different because uh, our sermon series is on family matters. And um, the message isn't directly geared towards the makeup of families, but I feel that this uh, message definitely deals with an important topic that families uh, should be praying about right now, and uh, especially on how to respond, how to speak to our kids about it, how to how to talk to our neighbors about it, all sorts of things. So, uh, as I've said throughout this series, Christian families should have their eyes fixed on Christ, and each day our hearts uh, and minds should be synced uh, to the heart of God. And that's not an easy thing to do with uh, all the distractions in this world, but um, if we keep uh, our families uh, in mind uh, and make sure that we're seeking God in everything, um, I feel that we can get the right response as a family. Um, so I felt led uh, this uh, past Sunday to talk about the conflict um, that's happening uh, in the Middle East currently. Uh, and I'd like to share this message. I, I finally felt that the spirit who had been prompting me for the last couple of weeks um, to talk about this had finally released me to share it. And so this is the message uh, that I felt the Spirit had given me um, uh, over the last couple of weeks and formulated and then given this past Sunday. And this is not a doom and gloom message. Um, and as I said, unless um, you're not in a right relationship with Christ, and then this could be a doom and gloom message. But on the contrary, in my opinion, um, my hope and prayer is that this message would provide clarity and encouragement to your soul. And that might even be a difficult thing for some of you when you think about the perhaps chance of World War III starting or even like nuclear war. Um, how could you have um, peace and clarity and encouragement from, from that thought? Um, but this message, in my opinion, does give that. I'm not sure what type of, <clears throat> excuse me, what person you are, whether you're a, I don't watch the news and hope it just doesn't affect me and we just move forward and it goes away uh, in due time, or if you're a type of person that sees the news and is, keeps track on it and, and you already have your bunker stocked and guns loaded and, and you're ready to do anything that uh, you need to do to survive. Well, this morning, um, as I give this message and as I did on Sunday, I, I, I this is not about physical preparation. I'm not going to do any sort of talk on physical preparation. That's not my place or my responsibility. My responsibility each Sunday morning when I give a message or even, uh, what is it, Tuesday morning that I give a message is to be obedient to the Spirit as the Spirit speaks to me and the message that God has laid on my heart for others to hear to share that exactly as God tells me to do that. So I'm going to address how we as believers should respond to what's happening and how we should prepare our families um, in light of the conflict that's happening in the Middle East. And, and what does God exactly want us to do with what's happening? And well, perhaps over the couple of weeks, um, you've been seeing posts on social media about um, a lot of end time stuff that Christians have been really perpetuating. Hey, end times, there's there's signs and symbols of, of the Armageddon that's right around the corner. And you just don't know how to handle that because maybe you've seen it over your lifetime multiple times or or you just don't know how to respond um, with biblical prophecies maybe being fulfilled, uh, maybe not, um, in, in spite of this conflict that's happening across the world. Well, this message, um, my hope is that it, I will do my best to cover what I can regarding what the people are talking about on social media. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not... Uh, professional theologian that deals with eschatology. I'm not professional in anything um, at all. 
Um, but eschatology, which is the study or, or the theology of end times and how it's going to happen. But but even the study of it is so complex and not cannot be fully known by anyone but God. And so um, for me to say this is how it's going to be or this is what's happening is just ludicrous. I, no one can possibly say this is exactly what's happening and this is what's going to happen because there are so many differing opinions. There's, you know, post-millennial, pre-millennial, amillennial and, and others, I think. But, I, you know, and so um, each person kind of needs to just wrestle with scripture and decide what they feel. And then, but in the end, it doesn't matter. In the end, how Jesus returns doesn't matter. All the, the only thing that matters is that Jesus is returning and that he calls us to be ready. Jesus will return and we are called as believers to be ready. And so I'm not going to dive into eschatology that much. All I'm, all my, my main point is that if this truly is the end and these are real signs of the end times, just be ready. That's our call as Christians. Okay, but let's go back to the conflict in the Middle East. In case you have lost uh, faith in the news and have not watched coverage as, you know, I got to admit that I'm that person that I don't really trust the news anymore. I'll just shine a little bit of light on what um, I've gathered has happened. A few weeks ago, uh, a Palestinian terrorist organization called Hamas attacked and killed many uh, Jewish of their Jewish neighbors um, since they're neighboring um, throughout Israel. Um, they kidnapped, abducted, abducted and, and killed many Jews, and they're still holding Jews hostages. Hamas is an Islamic terrorist organization that is bent on destroying every Jewish person to, to really to eradicate them from the face of the earth. Um, Israel has um, retaliated um, pretty quickly and swiftly, uh, protecting themselves and their people against this terrorist organization uh, of Hamas that runs um, the region of Gaza, that, that really runs the region, the Palestinian region of Gaza that um, people um, are, are living there. And so the, this terrorist organization, just want to make sure everyone understands, is really running the uh, as the leader of this region of Palestine. Now, just up front, not all Palestinians are evil terrorists. I just make sure everyone understands that, and that's my opinion. There are good people that are Palestinians. Um, there are good people that are Israelis. There are bad people that are Palestinians. There's probably bad Israelis. There are good Christians, and there are people that uh, call themselves Christians that are not. Okay, so there's that for portion of it. But within this conflict in the Middle East, what I want kind of everyone to understand is what I've gathered is there's so many Islamic nations that are really coming into, um, around, surrounding um, Israel, which is a part of that biblical prophecy that people are getting at. And so it seems like this is what's happening. So that's kind of where they're getting that, thinking of Ezekiel 38 and 39. Um, but all these Islamic nations are really coming in after um, Israel. And then you also have, you know, um, rumblings of Russia and China joining them in this endeavor. Um, but this conflict between the Palestinians and really Islam and the Jewish, Jewish nation of Israel is not a new conflict, far from it. I, just in our lifetime, we've seen this every certain number of years, it comes hot, hot and heavy again. And, and it goes even further back. If you think about really where it started was from Abraham. God, who said to Abraham, you're going to be the father of many nations, uh, father of a nation, and you'll have so many descendants that will come for you. And uh, God made that promise to Abraham, and Abraham um, was up in age, and his wife Sarah was up in age. And so he didn't wait on God's promise. And so he uh, went and had, uh, with Sarah's approval and Sarah's leading, had a child with Hagar, who is um, an Egyptian servant of Sarah's, and they had a son named Ishmael. Now this, God told Abraham, this was not what I said you were to do. You were to be faithful and wait on me, and then I would give you a child, and he would be the descendants. And so God uh, didn't really uh, give his covenant promise uh, to Isaac, not at all, or sorry, to Ishmael. Um, and later on, uh, God said, I told you I'd be give you uh, a son that would come from you and Sarah, and he would receive my covenant promise. And he would be the father of, of this nation. So Abram has a son named Ishmael. And then Sarah, in, in God's grace and God's goodness, they have, a, they have a son. And his name is Isaac. And Isaac is the, um, is the one that God gave his covenant promise to. 
the world would lead you to believe that this land of Israel, uh, formerly Canaan, is uh, this conflict is all about uh, wanting that land. But uh, I'm just going to let you know that it goes much further than that, far much further than that. As we learn in our last sermon series about uh, the tribe in, in the desert, uh, Israel in the desert, God had promised to give Israel the land of Canaan 3,200 years ago. And it's been their possession ever since. It's never been a Palestinian nation because Palestine is not a nation. They have an absolutely no claim on the land that God gave Isaac and his descendants whenever God sent them into that nation and they conquered all of the land and God gave it to them. This dispute is not uh, about land. What we're seeing in the Middle East right now is not about land. It's, it's about the annihilation of God's people the complete annihilation of God's people. And it's about preventing the fulfillment of the kingdom of God. The things that are happening in our world may be um, being done in our physical reality, but make no mistake, um, Satan is steering the ship of what's happening in the Middle East. This, this is another chess move and a long line of moves as he tries to desperately hold off um, his future destruction. What we are seeing in our world are the effects of a spiritual battle. There are physical realities hap happening, as we can clearly see in the Middle East, but they are caused by spiritual entities that are persuading and leading. How else do you explain the, th the terrible, evil things that are happening in our world all over? Uh, human trafficking, the, the deaths from drug addictions and abuse, Hamas chopping off babies' heads, Gender dysphoria being normalized as a normal everyday thing. The guy in Maine this past weekend that shot and killed 18 people. Or the fact that the UN, who is supposed to be our like uh, the thing that keeps peace across the world, who does not vote to denounce what Hamas did on October 7th and is allowing million and, and just seeing millions of people across the world siding with Hamas and, and being pro-Palestinian in this um, conflict. And they're siding with these people, Hamas, that uses children and women as human shields, protecting themselves from bullets by using women and children. That's who the world is backing, many in the world. It, it seems like everything is dark and, and, and the darkness is called light. And everything that used to be right is now evil. And as I see that, I, the only conclusion that I can come to in the, what the Spirit of God is telling me is that it's demonic. It's upside down. And that makes sense because we know from Scripture that Satan is lies. He's the king of lies. And anything that God creates that's good, Satan counterfeits and makes something evil to pull us away from what experience what God's goodness is. So Satan is the king of counterfeit things. There's an agenda that's happening in our world right now. And there's always been an agenda, but you can see it ramping up as time is clicking down. And there's an agenda to destroy everything and everyone that God made. As foretold in scripture, I believe Satan is desperately trying to destroy and prevent his end from happening as Jesus' second coming will be happening. And so he's desperately trying to save himself and postpone that. So he's lying and deceiving the world in order to push his desperate agenda to destroy God's people as fast as possible. And that includes God's original people. Okay, not just the church, God's original people, those that descended from Abraham's promise, the Israelites. And those that also those, he's trying to destroy them, God's original people, the the Israelites that God received, that God gave the promise through Abraham and then to Isaac, those people that come from that line, and also those that have been grafted into that promise, the Israelites, the sons and, oh, sorry, not the Israelites, the, the Gentiles, the church that have been adopted as sons and daughters that we read about in the New Testament. Those are the two forces that the evil one is trying to come against to destroy. I have seen what has been happening uh, in the world my entire life. I mean, I've not been around for that long, but I've, I've seen all this taking place in my lifetime and, and, and how much it's gotten worse just in the last couple of years, three to four years. 
how much upside down the world has gotten just in a short amount of time. And the Bible is clear it will continue to get worse as time goes on until God says it's over. It's finished. Jesus, he'll send Jesus back and Jesus will end it all. But make no mistake, the aim of Satan until that time comes is the aim of Satan and all his forces is to destroy the kingdom of God, which he will not be successful in. Satan will use any person, though, along the way. He'll use any person, any entity at his disposal, including nations, governments, false religions, or any people that don't know God and his word and are easily influenced. Easily influenced. I feel like that's what we're seeing when I look and I see millions of people siding with Hamas, that there's so many people that don't know God's word and are easily influenced by the enemy. Don't be surprised if it seems like the whole world is against everything God is for. In my opinion, anyone that sides with the things that are against God are not of God. How can you? And I'm I'm just going to say this uh, right now because because I believe it's the truth. There's this lie that's going around that uh, Islam and Christians and Jews all worship the same God, and that is not true. Yes, uh, Christians and, and Jews worship Yahweh, Elohim, uh, El Shaddai, all the names of God that you can come up with, but Allah is not the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament which is the same God. It's not. Allah may be the Arabic word for God, but it is not the same. If you just put a side-by-side -side comparison of who Allah is and who God is, there's a stark difference. You see, Jesus is the revelation of who God is. He came to earth so that we can know exactly who God is and can have a relationship with him. And if you look at Jesus and you look at who Allah is, there is an unbelievable difference. Now, I can tell you this for a fact that I, I, I'm i not fluent in all of Islam, I, but I do know enough to believe that this is true, that they are not the same. I can come to this conclusion. Islam was created 600 years after after Jesus was, was born. And it's believed that he is an extent, that, that not Jesus, but that Islam is the the... The religion is an extension of the Old Testament Bible, the Torah and everything. That it's, it's the fulfillment of the Old Testament. They believe that Jesus was a holy man, but they do not believe he is the Son of God, that he is God in flesh. I'm just going to let you know, again, Islam is not the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Covenant. Jesus is the new covenant and Jesus is the new covenant. Any religion that does not teach that Jesus is the Son of God, that is not of God. Any religion that does not teach that Jesus is the Son of God is does is not following what we know to be true from God's word. Jesus is the only source of salvation. He is the King of Kings and he's the Lord of Lords. And anything that does not believe that is false. It's, it's counterfeit. Where does counterfeit stuff come from? I already mentioned it. The evil one. Counterfeit comes from the evil one. Now, I do know as I say that, I understand that many Jews, um, God's original chosen, I mean, God's chosen people do not believe that about Jesus. They do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They don't believe he's the Messiah. Some do, some, but many don't. But the difference between what I said about Islam and, and Judaism is that God made his covenant with Abraham. That was passed on to Isaac. He did not with Islam. Ishmael, sorry, mix that. Ishmael. And Jesus commands, and even in that, so God has his God has his covenant promise that was given to Abraham that we must respect. We must respect. Okay? And 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 even Jesus commands his followers. That's that's all believers, all Christian believers, to begin making disciples where? In Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Okay? Where God's people are. See, God's heart will always be with Israel. When the whole world is against Israel, 
when we can see that, like it looks like it is, you can know that this isn't a physical battle. It's not just a physical battle, but it's a spiritual battle of darkness against light. Because we know God's covenant was with Abraham and his descendant, Isaac. And we must see that darkness versus light battle, and we must respond appropriately. I love Ephesians 6.12 speaks to this. It says, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world and against the mighty powers in the dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. See, if, if we are going against a spiritual force, we can't come at it with physical solutions because we will not find victory. Just bombing them is not going to create victory for us. As Christians, we have to battle spiritual battles with the Holy Spirit, with the Spirit of God. And God has given us blueprints on how to do that. And God left us those blueprints to follow, to know how to get to his end, that we already know the end, which is amazing. The good news of all of this is that we already know the ending. God wrote it out for us, and he never lies. He never lies, and he's going to fi uh, finish it out as he said it would be. And we're not um, to know exactly how that's going to happen, how it's going to get there, how exactly it's going to come uh, to fruition, but it is. It will happen in God's way, in God's timing, and we just need to be ready. And the best thing about it is the spoiler alert, God wins, and it's never in doubt. It's never in question. No matter what happens in our world, it's never in question. The Bible is clear on that. The enemy will work hard to try to prevent his doom from happening. But one day, Satan's plans will be revealed and obvious for everyone to see, especially for believers to see that Satan is at work. And, and it might happen even soon. Maybe this thing that's happening across the world right now, it might happen soon. It may be that. That This may be the beginning of the end. It may not. We can't know for sure. I'm not saying that this conflict of the millennium will turn into the prophecies that we read about, about the end of times in the Bible, um, that right the things, the battles are going to happen right before Jesus returns. I'm not saying it's not going to happen. I'm not saying it is going to happen. I mean, we could legitimately see uh, Ezekiel 38, 39 unfolding. We could see Isaiah 17, Psalm 83, and so on and so forth. You know, uh, Daniel 9, all these things happening right now, soon. It might happen. It may not. It might happen later. Maybe some of them have already happened and we missed it. But regardless, are you ready? Is your family ready? Our lives must be ready for this, this moment uh, our own, or, or just our own death. Our own death that could happen today, tomorrow, uh, years from now. Our lives need to always be ready to meet Jesus. Whether we our life is taken away, taken from us or Jesus returns, we need to be ready. Whichever happens first, be ready. That's what you should take away from all that's happening. This message, please take that away from this message. Those that are in Christ. Those of us that are in Christ don't need to fear or be scared because there is nothing that the enemy can do to affect your eternity. Can't do anything to you. Whether, whether your life is taken, he can't take away the eternity and the victory that we have in Christ. The physical body may perish and this earth may be torn apart and even destroyed. But no matter what, we have eternal victory in Jesus and he is going to win and Satan will be cast out and destroyed, cast out, sent to the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. Yes, Satan can attack the church, but he can't destroy it. Just think of the story of Job, how God uh, allowed Satan to tempt Job and come after Job and give him boils and take his family and all this different stuff, but he never was able to take Job's life. Satan can't destroy the faithful church because Jesus is the victor and Satan is bound and limited. One day before the appearance of the Lord, Satan will be loosed for God to make him a public spectacle before his defeat. 
That's the reason why God is going to lose him in the very end of age because God wants him to muster all of his forces to try to destroy his people and then God's going to come back through Jesus in his cosmic arena and Christ will be the victor once and for all and defeat Satan without even a without even a an arrow being shot or anything Christ is just going to stop it and it'll be done. I love Revelation 20, not 20 verse 9 it says fire came down from heaven and consume Satan and all his cohorts. Oh, what a day that's going to be to see God and make a spectacle of Satan. See, Satan is not God's opposite. God created him and he's a creating being. So if he's created by God, they're not in the same universe when it comes to power and authority. The end results of the end times will never be in question. It never has been. It never will be in question. And we know Jesus Christ, um, we know those that know Christ and have the Spirit, Holy Spirit living inside of us cannot be defeated by Satan as long as we walk in the Spirit. We don't need to walk and be afraid of the enemy's plans and his advancements that we're gonna, we may see or in this world as it gets darker and darker and darker. You don't need to cower in fear before him. Understand Satan's dangerous. We see what he did to Job and all that stuff. Understand that he's dangerous and that he has powers. And he's the ruler of this world. But understand God has given you everything that you need to be victorious against everything that he brings at you. So fear not, brothers and sisters in Christ. For Satan's end is coming near and he knows it. He absolutely knows it. See, many people think this is the beginning. As I said, there you see it all over Facebook. This is the beginning of the end. And, and to that, I say, maybe, maybe, I don't know. I definitely know that today we are closer to the end than we have ever been before. Every single day is a day closer to the coming of Jesus. The Bible gives warning signs, as, as we've been talking about, and signs to be on the lookout for. But no one can know the day or the hour. But there are signs. There's We will know the season. We will know that Satan is loosed. We know that it, it's going to be close. It's going to happen at any moment. We will know when that time is. Matthew 24 verse 36 says, No one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. Now, just understand this. That does not mean that Jesus does not currently know when he's going to return. It's not like God's going to come into, come into where Jesus is and be like, all right, Jesus, your turn to go. I'm ready. And she's like, oh, okay, let me get my stuff. No, no, Jesus, Jesus, the Father and the Son are one. Okay, they know in the Spirit. They, they know. Jesus, just when he said this verse, was actively humbling himself and taking the form of a servant as he came to earth so that he could um, be the one, voluntarily restrict himself and his divine nature so he could fulfill the mission that he had on earth. So he voluntarily restricted his knowledge at that moment, but make no mistake, Jesus knows. We may not know the day, but Jesus left us signs to see it coming. I highly encourage everyone to read Matthew chapter 24, verse 4, on verse 24, basically all of chapter 24, read it as Jesus talks about the end times and Jesus talks about the signs and the things that are going to happen as the ending is coming to a close. To look at those signs, I highly encourage you to read that. But before you read that, pray. I encourage you to pray. Every time you read God's word, pray, Spirit, please speak to me, Lord. Please speak to me and share with me what you want me to know from this Reveal it to me. Reveal to me what information you want me to bury into my heart and my mind. Help me understand it. Now, I do understand that Matthew 24, a lot of it was spoken to for the disciples. And so was a lot of Luke 21, which is just kind of Luke's version of Matthew's version of chapter 24. He says in Luke 21, and I like a certain part in chapter 21 of Luke that I just want to make note of. Luke chapter 21, verse 11 through 13. 
It says there will be great earthquakes and there will be famines and plagues in, the, in, in many lands at that time. And there will be terrifying things and great miraculous signs from heaven. See, we often forget that great and miraculous signs from heaven, that it's not only will there be darkness and bad things happening all over the world, famines and earthquakes, and all that stuff, but there will also be great miraculous signs from heaven that are going to be happening. So that's going to be things that we see in the heavens, but it's also going to be people within the church, the church doing miraculous wonders and signs by the power of the Holy Spirit for the world to see. So as the darkness is pressing on the light, the light of Jesus is going to be pushing against it. Oh, man. So as the darkness pushes, the light is going to also be pushing at the same time. Verse 12, but before all this occurs, there will be a time of great persecution. You will be dragged. You will be dragged into synagogues and prisons and you will stand trial before kings and governors because you are my followers. Okay. And then verse 13, but this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. Now, again, this is Jesus telling this to his disciples because we see this in Acts, we in, in, the, in the epistles. We see this happened in the, in the, um, in the epistles that, that they were ripped out and they were sent to synagogues and sent to prisons and, and then eventually were killed in the name of Jesus. And God gave them this platform during this persecution and tribulation in order to speak and tell the world about Jesus. And God used that platform to bring people into faith and salvation in him. And he will do the same for us. The same um, tribulation, I, I believe the tribulation um, is something that has been hap that's been that's been taking place in 70 AD since the second temple was destroyed. I think it started then and it's still going. I think it's going to get hotter. It's going to get worse and worse and worse as we get to that end moment. But I think we're in the midst of that tribulation right now. That we're in the midst of Matthew 24 and Luke 21 and, and Revelation 7, 14 right now, right in this very moment that the church has always been under persecution and it will continue to be under persecution, past and present. It was in the persecution in the past and it's in persecution in the present. It's just hard for Americans to wrap their arms, their eyes around this or their minds around this because we've never truly experienced real persecution. We've just experienced people not liking us. Or, or not liking us knowing Jesus and loving Jesus. Okay, but across the world, the church has truly been persecuted where their life is at risk. And I believe we're going to experience that soon. I think the message of Matthew 24 and, and uh, Revelation 7, uh, 14 and, and Luke 21, all that is going to come. Um, it, it's still a message for us today that we're going to need to take and heed. And it's a foretelling for us. And something we've already seen happen. But great miraculous miracles and signs and wonders are going to take place. People are going to come to know Jesus that have never known Christ. If we are faithful to Christ and we are faithful to the Spirit's leading, people who don't know Jesus, our enemies are going to come to know Christ. ISIS people, Hamas people, whatever, whatever people we are warring against across the world or our enemies are going to come to know the saving power of Jesus Christ if we remain faithful to him, that our lives are going to be uh, used by Jesus and used by, uh, through the power of the Spirit to, to be an example and are going to be used to draw people into salvation. I can't wait for that moment that God will use us Use the light that he's placed in our souls as believers to push back the darkness. One day, and, and hopefully today, that might begin in your life if it's not already being done through. As we just read, one of the signs of the end from Matthew 24, verse 37, just want to recap that one more time. It says, when the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. If you go to then Genesis 6, Verse 13, when it, in Noah's day, what does it say about the days of Noah? It says, I have decided, God's saying this to Noah, I have decided to destroy all living creatures for they have filled the earth with violence. Yes, I will wipe them all out from the earth. Along, or wipe all of them along, out. The Hebrew word that is used here to describe violence 
is a word that should sound familiar for those of us that have been maybe listening to this message or listening to the news. The word for violence that God uses here is a Hebrew word called Hamas. Zechariah 14 tells us the nations will be gathered into Jerusalem to fight against it. And then in verse 3, it says that then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he has fought in times past. See, God will fight as he has done in the past. So he will so his ending will be fulfilled. So it was been predicted for thousands of years that the earth would one day be filled with Hamas, a word that we keep hearing. And again, the conflict is not about land, but it's about destroying God's kingdom. But as I've said, and as what Zechariah says to us in verse 3, Zechariah 14, that God will fight the battle for us. He will use us and with the Spirit's power will fight through us. See, Satan knows the word. He knows the word of God. He knows his end is coming, that Jesus is coming and it will be all over for him. And yes, it may happen at any moment. It could happen now. It could happen in 10 years. It could happen in in 100 years, 1,000 years, whatever. I hope it's not. My question is, are you ready? If he comes back right now, are you ready? If you love Jesus, his coming is the best day you could ever possibly hope for in your life. If you don't love Jesus, his coming will be the worst day you ever experience in your life. For Christians, we're not going to hell, but we may have to go through it as we get to heaven. Until Jesus comes back, those last days may be terrible things that happen. The Bible says, again, that we read in, in Matthew 24 that there are birth pains that are going to happen. Birth pains, like a, like a pregnant woman giving birth and, and out of the greatest pains as it continues to get worse and worse and worse as birth pains do, the greatest joy will come in the end when new life is brought. As we get closer to the end and we get closer uh, to Jesus' return, those birth pains will get more and more intense. But let me tell you, friends, it's worth the wait. It's worth the difficulty. Let's just read about it here as I'm, as I'm closing up. Let's just read about that moment when Jesus returns in 1 Thessalonians verse 4, verses 13 through 17. We want you to know what uh, he says, as Paul says, what we want you to know what will happen uh, to the believers who have died so you will not grieve like people who do not have that hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. Okay? We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout and the voices of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, first the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then in verse 17, then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on earth will be caught up into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. Just want to make sure you understand all of that. Jesus will come down, stopping midair with a shout and a trumpet blaring by angels. It says, the first thing that will happen is the dead in Christ shall rise and Jesus will bring with him the souls of those who have died. And there in the air, a reunion will take place where those that have already died and, and Jesus has their, their, spirit, their souls and those bodies, he'll raise them up to have new bodies and those new bodies, those, those new eternal bodies and their souls will come and be united with Jesus in the air. And the world will experience this. All of us that are in Christ will watch this happening in the sky. And then it will be our time after that, after they come together, all those that have died in Christ, then those that are in Christ that are alive still that day, still on that day, will be risen up and all of the believers will be in the sky. Oh, man. What a day that will be. And then uh, those that belong to Christ. So all that belong to Christ that are still living and those that were dead will be called up to Christ in the air, mid air. 
And that word called up is the Greek word that is translated as rapture, to be called up to Christ. And then when we will see, then I love that last, last little section that Paul leaves us there. And then we will be with the Lord forever, forever. What an amazing moment. Question is, are you ready? Jesus, after he gives to Matthew 24, he moves to Matthew 25. And in Matthew 25, we read about this parable that Jesus says about being ready when he talks about lamps. And there were 10, 10 virgins that were had lamps and they're waiting for their bridegroom to come. And five prepared and five didn't prepare. And those that didn't prepare, the bridegroom came and they didn't have enough oil in their lamp. And so they went to go find oil. But the bridegroom came when they were waiting. And those five that were ready, he came and got them. And they went and got married and they had their wedding celebration. Then the five that weren't ready came back with their oil that they got extra from, from the store. And they came back knocking on the door and the door was locked to them. It was locked. They missed out. Friends, be prepared or be locked out. God is not going to force you into a relationship with him. You have every chance to love God and follow him while you're alive. When you die, it doesn't change. When you come face to face with an eternal with eternal life in God, if you didn't accept him and he didn't force you to accept him while you're alive, he's not going to force you into heaven or allow you into heaven. God's not going to force you to do anything that you don't choose to do. If you didn't want to do it then, he's not going to if you didn't choose him when you're alive, he's not going to force you to choose him when you're dead. He's going to let you make the choices that you want to make even after he's made every effort for you. If Jesus fulfilled 350 some prophecies foretold in his first coming, He's not going to miss out on fulfilling all the prophecies that are made about his second coming. Jesus is coming back, friends. Church, be ready. This is not some weird theology that we don't believe here at 1COG. It's our blessed hope. It is our promise that one day Jesus is literally going to split the skies and every knee in heaven and on earth will bow down to Jesus and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. He will return for his bride. Stay awake. Keep your lamps full. The prayers for a family, our families, our prayers need to be that we have a full lamp. And we need to shout the word Maranatha, which means our Lord is coming. Is that our prayer? Is that our family prayer every day when we wake up? Our lamps are full. Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus, come. The ready family, our prayer should be, come, Lord Jesus, with wholehearted love for you. We long for your coming, but until that day comes, we will do our part, living out your mission to make disciples, to make disciples of you. Is that our prayer for our families? No matter what happens with this conflict or what happens in the future, it's not the time for believers to run and hide. It's not the time for us to hide and to isolate ourselves from the world or to isolate our kids from the world. It's time to open the doors to the church, our churches, to open the doors to our homes as being the church and invite people to hear about Jesus and his saving power and what he's going to do for us and what he's already done for us. Church, we can't run and hide. We must swing wide the doors of our lives. As uh, Swing open the, those doors and draw as many people as we can to the feet of Jesus. That's our responsibility. That's how we should live our lives. No matter what happens over in the Middle East, and no matter if World War III starts, no matter if this is the second coming of Christ, no matter what, that's our call as the church no matter what is happening in this world, it's time for evangelism, friends. It's time for discipleship. You know, this past week, I had an amazing thing happen to me, and I just want to share this story with all of you. I Every every day, almost every day, five days a week at least, I run um, on our track here in our town, and as I'm running on the track, I usually run about two miles, and I just kind of felt a dryness in my spirit. 
And I felt like I needed to really have an encounter, really needed to draw myself, my life into worshiping God. And I desired to worship God. And so as I was running the track, I, I spent dedicated time to worship Jesus. And I prayed and prayed and prayed, God, would you please Please come. I want to be in your presence, Lord. I want to be in your presence. As I run around this track, I want to be in your presence. So I started running and and it's, it was drizzling that day. It was rainy, a dreary day. And I was like, oh, Spirit, come. Lord, fill my heart. I want to feel your presence. Please, Lord. I want my life as I'm running, as I'm experiencing you. I want my whole life to be a pleasing aroma to you. Because I understand as sacrifices happen in the Old Testament, as God, we would sacrifice our best to Jesus that um, to, to God that it would go up, the smoke would go up and it'd be a pleasing aroma to God. And I wanted my life to be a pleasing aroma, a pleasing aroma of the sacrifice, the, the worship that I'm doing, my life, my dedication to Jesus would be a pleasing aroma. And that was my prayer as I was running around the track <clears throat> and it was sprinkling. And as I was thinking in my head, I'm like, oh man, how amazing it would be if it starts raining and he's raining down his blessings and raining down um, his love and grace down on me and I'd experience that and that'd be part of this worship experience. And so I was longing for like this very impactful moment to happen in my life. As I was running around, I finished my two laps and didn't really feel that overwhelming. I was definitely feeling the spirits leading and was getting emotional at times. And I was definitely worshiping the Lord and feeling his presence, but not that overwhelming, you know, push over the side moment. So I decided to walk another, walk another mile. And as I did that, I just continued to pray, Lord, please just let me know I'm doing a good job. Please let me know my life is, is, is pleasing to you. Please just let me know. And I was walking and walking and the rain started picking up. I'm like, here we go. Oh, here it goes. It's going to start pouring down rain on me. And I'm going to know that God is pleased by me. It never started pouring down rain. But I still was felt like I was in God's presence. So I went back to my car and I got in my car kind of wet from all of the for the drizzles and the slow rain. And I was still worshiping God. But as I got in the car and I started driving back as I normally do, I I um, started to drive, I started pulling out. And I'm like, man, my car stinks. And so I have kids and I'm looking around thinking, did my son leave his cleats from football practice? Did my son leave? Well, I mean, like, did someone leave something in my car? And I, I knew, I mean, I did run. So I knew I had kind of stinkiness from running and stuff, but I know my stank and it did not smell like my normal stinkiness. And I'm like, you know, smell myself, smelling behind me. I can't s figure out what this is. And I'm driving and I'm still listening to worship music and still trying to be in God's presence, but I keep getting distracted by the smell. And I'm like, what in the world is this smell? I'm gonna have to clean out my car and I would like to roll down my windows and get this smell out of here, but it's raining outside. And by the time I'm in the car, it's now pouring down rain. So I get about, about three miles, right actually in front of our church. And as I'm driving past our church and I stop at the stop sign outside of our church on my way back to my house to shower, I'm turning around and smelling. I'm like, what in the world is this smell? And the Spirit of God came and told me, Zach, that's you. That is the pleasing aroma that you are putting off. That's the pleasing aroma. When you worship me with all of your heart and you desire and long to be with me, that is the pleasing aroma that I smell from your life. And it is so pleasing to me. It is so pleasing to me. And I immediately broke I started bawling and crying because that was the moment that I longed for. And a good God that we serve showed some showed me the, how much that he loves me. And he gave me exactly what I needed to, to run this race and to, and to live this life. The reason I tell you this story is not to show, look what I got. Look what I got to experience. No, I tell you this story because when we choose to love and follow God, no matter what's happening in our world, and we choose to honor Jesus and to follow God and to worship him, whether this is the end or this is just one of the birthing pains, well, no matter what, if we just worship the Lord, open our homes to people to live out the mission of Christ of making disciples, Jesus, our life will become a pleasing aroma to him. It will become a pleasing aroma to him and he will just smell and be like, that's my son. That's my daughter whom I'm well pleased. And he will watch over us and he will allow our lives to be pleasing to him.
to live is Christ, to die is gain. It doesn't matter. In between, we will love Jesus. Will you love Jesus? Are you ready to serve Jesus, to know him, to follow him? Do you pray, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, come. I pray that you 